If you would, take your Bibles and open to Philippians chapter 3. We're going to return to this book. We started this book, if you remember, and I know everybody does. Um, in 2017, remember the beginning of our transition phase, um, before Biddy came along, um, I was preaching on Sunday nights when we started this book, and we got about 11, or we got about 10 sermons in, and then Brother Biddy came on, so then... Stop preaching, of course. Uh, and then we've, we've hit a couple other Philippian sermons between now and since then and now, but um, we're going to return. We're going to actually get to finish it. Um, this will be the first book that I get to finish with the adults. If you remember, when I first came on staff, we started the book of Colossians, and we have yet to finish that one, even though we're making a little bit of headway. We got halfway, kind of had, you know, new pastor. And it's funny how pastor would like to preach. Um, we're going to... We're going to do a couple things tonight. We're going to do a short catch-up. And then we're going to get into our sermon tonight. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 7. So we'll, um, we'll stand and read in just a minute. But I'm going to, I'm going to catch us up on, on where we're at. Kind of what we've walked through already. And um, kind of go from there. So Philippians is a special church for Paul. Um, this, this was... Uh, would call it like a home church to Paul, but Paul had a special relationship with this group of people. I mean, he, he loved all the churches he went to, all the churches that he started, but the book, the, the church at Philippi, he just had a, a special relationship with. And um, if you read any of his epistles, as Brother Chris will get through, um, he wrote these letters to churches that had a lot of turmoil inside of them. With the church at Philippi, he, he kind of was writing a letter before they really started having the false teachers come up and all this kind of stuff. You can imagine he had such a love and here he is going around to all these other churches that he's been ministering to, having to go back and correct the false teachers, having to go back and correct all these issues. And he just had Philippi in his mind and he sent them this letter and it was kind of just a, a letter of encouragement more than anything. Um, just to, to kind of help them to know, hey, this is coming your way. You're going to begin to face these kind of things because one, well, I'm dealing with that in, in the outside of these other churches. And so it's kind of just a letter that he wanted to, um, to send to them. So we're going to go through this part really quick. So listen fast. Um, it was written between 61 and 62 AD. Um, the, ch the church was founded in the early 50s um, during Paul's second missionary journey. And Philippi itself was formed around 368 BC. So that's a little bit of the background. Reasons for the letter. A letter to say thanks. A letter about receiving Epaphroditus um, and the fellow worker. Um, a letter of encouragement, an appeal for unity, which we'll talk about when we talk about the theme again in a second. And to take a united stand in truth and work for the gospel. Three major events that happened in this church was the salvation of Lydia. The demon possessed was free and the, the jailer and his family was saved. If you remember all those, those accounts. Um, the founding of the church had three key factors. Prayer, preaching and a concern for individual and sacrificial commitment to the work of God. Now, you can go down to Lifeway. Well, you used to be able to go down to Lifeway. You can pull up ChristianBook.com, click on the church growth section, and there's going to be a lot, a lot of books that are going to pop up. And the sad thing is, they may mention this in passing, but it'll be a little footnote that they're going to tell you what you ought to do. Do what I do, because this is through the church. But how do they grow the church? Prayer, preaching, and a concern for individual and sacrificial commitment to what? The work of God. So, want to grow our church? That's where we can begin. Um, so, they founded the church by bringing individuals to personal commitment to Christ the Savior. There's a novel idea. Um, again, this was Paul's heart. This letter was a very personal one for him. You could tell that it was full of warmth. Um, and it was a product of his head and his heart. He loves this church. And, and we know this church has supported his ministry. Um, a lot of times uh, when he, they received and they sent their uh, offerings to him to help support the work that he was doing. Um, two themes, unity and under attack. And the overall call that we see through this book is to live in Christ's likeness, to make urgent progress in holiness, and long to bring others to faith in Christ. Some theological overturn, over, overtunes, overtones, there we go. Is Christ be glorified, unity in Christ, justified by Christ, and Christian living? So if we were to sum this up, ultimately unity comes when we 
develop the mind of Christ in us. And that's really the whole thing. And as we've talked about before, the, the theme that we've been unpacking is the unifying strength of joy. And to have joy, you've got to have the gospel. To have strength, you've got to have the gospel. And you can't have one of those three things without it. Joy, strength, and the gospel go hand in hand. If you're a child of God tonight, you have an underlying joy in your life regardless of how tough life is. Because the toughness of life is all part of God's plan living in this fallen world. And it's part of the curse of sin that, yes, we even as redeemed people walk through. And there's purpose for it. John Piper says, don't waste your suffering. It's not in void. It's not in vain. God is doing something through it. And we all know that if we were honest, most of the time that we've really grown in our faith was when times were hard, tough. Because that's just where we're naturally bent that way to, to be like, well, if time is good, well, it's good because I'm doing good. And then when God taps us on the shoulder, we say, okay, that's right, I'm not doing good because of me, I'm doing good because of Him. God help me again. And so those are, those are the, the, the kind of the, the theme that we've been unpacking, the unifying strength of joy. So a couple of, few of the things that we've already talked about is the introduction of joy, which was the gospel, the thanksgiving of joy, the prayer of joy, the proclamation of joy, the rejoicing of joy, the life of joy, the suffering of joy, the humility of joy, the glory of joy, the obedience of joy, the testimony of joy, and tonight we're going to look at the confidence of joy. And so if you would... Take your scripture, if you would stand, if you're able to. We're going to read Philippians chapter 3, 1 through 7. And again, the title is The Confidence of Joy. He says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me, and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh, also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I am more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of the Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law of blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have tonight to look at your word. And Lord, I just pray that you would do a work in us to continue to strengthen our unity, to strengthen our zeal to take this gospel to those that are lost and that need you in this community. And Lord, build your church by standing on your truth, proclaiming your truth, and seeking your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So we're going to see four short things tonight from this passage. Dealing with the confidence of our joy. And hopefully, if, if you've been here and you've gone through any of these sermons, you can kind of vaguely remember them because it's been a little while. I hope that you can continue to see how all of these things flow together. So when we talk about the confidence of our joy, we have to ask the question, okay, what is confidence? Where, where is our confidence? And why do we have this kind of confidence? So the four things we're going to look at, the first one is our confidence is rooted in what we believe. And so when you, when you look at verse number one, you can kind of see when he says, finally, my brothers, he's, he's kind of making a transition. Um, almost, you could even think of it as like when a pastor says, all right, this is my final point. What's coming? You don't know how many more points are coming, but there's more than one. Um, it, it's, it's kind of one of those things. So he's shifted out of all of the things, that list that we just talked about, all of those things concerning joy, and, and he's shifting to this, this, this concept now. He says, finally, my brothers. And, and the idea is, um, as for the rest, is concerned. Let's move on. So he's not like coming, it's not, it's not like his final point. But he's kind of taken everything that he's already talked about. It's okay, now, concerning the rest of the things, this is what I want you to focus on. And he says, rejoice in the Lord. Now, knowing the background of the letter, we know that Paul is not just sending out a Christian cliche. Oh, bless your heart, guys. He's coming from a very sincere place. 
He knows the attacks that other churches are going through. He knows the theological issues that they're dealing with. He knows very well that a false gospel has crept into these churches. And he's thinking about his brothers here that he loves in this church. And he wants them to, to know, almost like a foundational level, rejoice in the Lord. So what does it mean to rejoice in the Lord? If, if we think about, you know, even in our day and time, the, the spiritual battles that are facing us, even from our communities. What, what are we going to be facing in the future? What are we going to be able to do, not be able to do, say, not say, all these kind of stuff. But what, so what do we do? We rejoice in the Lord. And in, in this, it's not just, you know, oh, bless your heart. It's a, no, really, to go through what you're about to begin to face, you need to rejoice in the Lord. And it's, it's not just a, an empty, superficial cheerfulness that ignores the realities of life and the hardships that come. As a matter of fact, it's quite the opposite. It's taking into account the hardships that is allowed by our sovereign God to enter into our life for His glory, our betterment, and a testimony to the gospel in our life. So it's just almost like a reminder. Listen, you know, times are coming. Things are coming. But put your foundation in the gospel. Put your foundation in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. We've talked about the idea of joy, you know, the unifying strength of joy. What is joy? Joy is not an emotion. Happiness is an emotion. Each day, at some point in time, we might be happy. The other point in the day, we might be sad. But our joy is settled because it's in the gospel. And we know regardless of what happens in this life, we get the best outcome. Because if I die, where do I wait? In the presence of my Savior. If I live the rest of this life and struggle and struggle, what do I know is coming? My Savior is coming back for me. And so my joy is set because my joy is set in the one that gives it, and that is Christ. And that's not an emotion. Happiness is an emotion, and happiness is good and all kind of stuff, but the joy. And so he says rejoice in the Lord. It is to, to, to take hold of this joy that we have and grasp it and seek it and let it be our foundation. And that way when life does come, Yes, we'll be sad, we'll be hurt, we'll be whatever emotions, whatever things, but at the end of the day we'll come back and we'll rest in our Christ because it still gives us reason to rejoice because we have redemption. And that's the idea, that is what Paul wants all of us to understand. Rest in Christ, rejoice in the Lord. Then he walks and he says, and then he goes on, he says, to write the same things to you is no trouble to me. So this is kind of giving us an idea that this might be some teachings that, that he's about to go through that he's already taught them. This is, whether it be through a letter or when he was there, he's already talked about this stuff. He says, listen, to write to you on the same things is no trouble to me. Now, it's kind of a weird phrasing for us in our day and time. You know, what do you mean? That's, that's just an odd way of phrasing it. And the way I was kind of thinking about it is, you know, when I preach, and I've made this joke before, it seems like I preach the same thing over and over again because it's the gospel. And that's what we need. And it doesn't trouble me whatsoever to stand up and preach. And I know for Brother Chris, and you can ask him to come preach at your house or at your whatever. And guess what? He's going to joyfully come just like I would because we love to preach. It is no bother. This does not bother Paul at all. Paul does not have a problem coming back with the same thing. As a matter of fact, it probably brings joy to his heart to be able to stand before the people that he loves and continue to proclaim the gospel and to preach and teach the word of God because it's just part of who he is and his love for them. He says it doesn't, it's not troublesome whatsoever. It doesn't trouble me. And as a matter of fact, it's safe for you. It's security for you. Why is it security? I pick up my Bible, but it's too big. This is our security. Whatever it is that you're facing in life, guess what? You can find comfort in this book. Now, is it going to tell you specifics of what college you go to, what, what husband or wife to, or you know, what girlfriend, boyfriend to marry, or all this other kind of stuff? No, but it'll address it. And if we have a good relationship with this, we have a good relationship with God. But you can't have a good relationship with God without a good relationship with this because this is our everything. God in His sovereignty said, I'm going to reveal myself to my people through my word. During the Old Testament times, there, there's prophets that would come and proclaim the word of God, who would speak for God. And I love the book of Hebrews says, in the last days, he has spoken to us through his son. There is nothing else God is going to speak to us. You know why? Because he's got it all right here. 
It's safe for us. It's our security. This book will guard us from all kinds of things. What does it need to guard us from? In verse number two, he continues. He says, look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. So what does the word look out mean? Clearly it's important because he's repeated it three times. Look out is be on guard. To watch, to look out for, to be aware of. Because this stuff creeps in. Again, the, the, the false teachers that have crept up in these churches that we read in the Bible and throughout all of church history, they didn't show up dressed in a devil suit with a pitchfork and a pointed tail. They dressed to the nine. They taught wonderfully. And it captivated people, or as Paul said in the book of Galatians, it bewitched people with their teaching and their understanding of spiritual things. And wow, that makes a lot of sense. Wow! And because they didn't know their doctrine and their theology and their Bible enough, they were taken captive, as Paul describes in other places, by this teaching. Look out for the dogs. What is that talking about? Well, in this day and time, it, called a dog was an insult. Um, but it's not even really talking about that aspect of it. It's talking about the ritually uncleanness. I mean, in essence, it's the view of the false teachers and the Judaizers as Gentiles, lost out of the faith, though they claim to represent. So again, false teachers come in, they begin to teach they have, they're very charismatic. They have a very good gift of teaching. And they seem smart. They seem like they know things. And so then after a while, they begin to creep in with their false teachings. There's many, many people throughout even my, my few years in, in ministry. I remember there's one author back 15 years ago who wrote a book. And there's a lot of theologians that were like, oh, you know, there's, ah, there's, there's some themes in this book that aren't right. And he was like, oh, no, 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 that's not what I meant. That's not what I meant. That's not what I meant. <laughs> He came out with those other books, and I'm like, hey, you know, there, there's some, oh no, that's not what I that's not what I all this kind of stuff, and then, you know, about 10 years after he built his huge following, he came out and wrote a book that confirmed all of the concerns that every other theologian had about it. Because that's what they do. Man, I would always hear, that's a great teacher. I'm like, yeah, but he's teaching bad stuff. That's how these false teachers work. These dogs, they come in and they're representing our faith, but they're not teaching our faith. They're teaching aspects of it. It sounds enough right, but there's little things that they're adding in, and that's the problem. What about the evildoers? Of course, this is people who do what is wrong, sinners, regardless of how religious one claims to be. So again, you've got this group that are claiming to be wonderfully religious, and yet their lifestyle and the things that they do are contrary to that. And so this is what, what gets me, you know, I say this a lot, the gospel is not broken. Every time the gospel is applied to somebody's heart, guess what happens? They're changed, they're supernaturally made alive, and their life is different. There's no, there's no other option. If those things don't take place, guess what? The gospel hasn't been applied to that person's heart, regardless of the confession. Now, it doesn't mean they're going to live a perfect life. They're going to struggle with sin, just like you and I struggle with sin. But for someone to, to claim salvation and have no fruit or evidence of it, they're not saved. They're not a child of God. They didn't have it to lose it. They never had it to begin with. And you have an easy believism, there are so many converts in this world today that believe that they're saved because they said a prayer, walked down an aisle, were baptized, and they're not. And they live lives like this. They appear to be religious. They have a confession. You talk to them, oh yeah, I got saved when I went to kids church. Oh, what church did you go to? Oh man, I haven't been to church since then. Man, that's what, 30 years ago. It doesn't work that way. When the gospel enters in, it changes it. So if we have people that claim to be religious and yet their life doesn't match up with it, it's okay to say, you know what? You might want to think about your salvation. I know we live in a day and time where we're supposed to tolerate everybody to, to say anybody's wrong and that is, you know, man, you're just a really evil bully. Um, no, the Bible tells us to hold one another 
accountable to the Word of God. If you claim Christ, you're begging the church to judge you according to the Scriptures. Now, if you don't want me to judge you, then I won't, because the Bible tells me not to judge sinners because they're judged already. But if you claim Christ as your Savior, you're begging everybody in this room and out there that claims and knows Christ as your Savior to hold you accountable to the Word of God. And guess what? We all need it. Brother Chris and I, Dan, we all need it. Then look out for who? Those who mutilate the flesh. Now again, of course, in, in context, it's talking about circumcision. And so what this is talking about empty religious um, practices. Um, but they're an actual rejection of God's truth or way. So in essence, it's those who have mixed pagan rituals with Christianity. Something along those lines. They claim to be of the circumcision. But it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're not going about God's way. If you're coming with these new teachings, of course, the Judaizers are very good about, you know, if you want to be a true follower of Christ, yeah, you've got to believe and have faith in Christ, but you, ought to believe, but you also have to do some of these Jewish rituals. You've got to be circumcised. And, and I love how he worded it. Those who mutilate the flesh, that's all they're doing. Because we know physical circumcision has nothing to do with our salvation, nothing to do with our spiritual state. It's the circumcision of the heart that the Holy Spirit does through our salvation that gives us salvation and forgiveness and justification. That other stuff, if I, if I do any other kind of stuff, that's all it is, is empty religion and empty mutilating of the flesh. And so these are the three aspects of what Paul has warned us against. So, our confidence of joy is grounded in what we believe. And we're told to be on guard about other kinds of beliefs that can creep in. From the dogs, from the evildoers, and from those who mutilate the flesh. They all have a sense of religious, a sense of, of Jesus loving, but yet they don't. In reality, they don't. In reality, they've done what the human heart wants to do, and that is to say, I'm gonna, I can do things that are good to make me better, and I'm going to stand in that. But our joy does not come from that. Our joy comes from our faith and what we believe. And I love, in, in a lot of the letters that Paul goes to, he, he reminds the church, hey, go back to the things that I brought you first. The gospel that, that saved you. Go back to that. Compare it to the new teachings that you're now believing because some other teacher came in. And see the difference. It's that foundation of the gospel. When you were saved, when you confessed Christ, when you came down, you made it public, whatever it looked like in your life, when you were saved, go back to that and hold to that because that is what matters. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the thing that frees us, it's the thing that saves us, and it's the very thing that gives us confidence. Because without it, we don't have anything as we're about to see. But our confidence begins with what we believe. The, the second question we have to ask is, what it, it, where, where else is our confidence at? Well, it's rooted in who we are. If you look at verse 3, he says, For we are the circumcision, who worship by the Spirit of God, and glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. So, who are we? How can I have confidence in who I am? Who was I before Christ came into my life? Well, I was a God hater, according to the Bible. I was serving myself, I was worshiping myself, I was a slave, I had a master, and my master was sin, and I was doing sin's bidding. According to Romans chapter 1, I was suppressing the truth about God, I was worshiping the creation instead of the creator. And that's who I was. But when the gospel came, which was applied to my heart, to the Spirit of God, through somebody faithfully telling me about Jesus, and God opened my eyes, and I was redeemed, and I was saved, and I confessed my sin, I became somebody else. I think, was it you? Was, did you sing a song this morning about a new name? Yeah. Because I'm new in Christ. I am somebody else now. Who am I? We are the circumcision. What does it mean, circumcision? We just got done talking about how the circumcision doesn't mean anything. Well, we're, we're the spiritually circumcised. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of salvation, which is I am dead in my sin, 
hopeless without God doing something because I can't do anything on my own. I have to trust in the Messiah that He provided. And in my trusting, I recognize and repent of my sin. And I place my faith and my trust in Jesus Christ and understand that He's the one that went and bore the wrath of God for my sin in my place. And in this great exchange, we call it when I repented of my sin, Christ took my sin and at the same time, He gave me His righteousness. And in that moment, I had become circumcised. My heart was circumcised. The heart of stone was ripped out. The heart of flesh was put in. The scales were removed from my eyes. And I saw the glory of who Christ was. I am now a different person. I belong to a different family. And it's because I've been circumcised spiritually and made alive. And that's what is Paul's bringing out here. We are the circumcision. That regardless of who, who claims, oh, I, I, I've been circumcised, I do this. Listen, it doesn't matter. What did Christ do to you? Well, He has circumcised me where I needed it most. That was in my dead heart. Who worship by the Spirit of God. We've heard that before. What did Jesus say to the woman at the well? Was it the woman at the well? Or the woman? Well, he was talking to a woman somewhere. And she was like, hey, I'm a little confused. My people say worship over here. They say worship over there. What do we do? And Jesus says, listen, there's a time coming when people will worship in the spirit of truth. What does that mean? That the gospel is going to be on full display. That this Messiah, that the people of God were looking forward to coming, even though they, the majority missed, this Messiah was going to be on display. And it's going to be the moment of time when God wanted it to happen. And to say, this is the time, this is the reason this creation was here for me to crush my son on your behalf. To bring you redemption and adoption into my family. To prepare my kingdom for when I come back and do away with sin and establish the heaven and earth. Where I'm going to dwell with my people the way it was going to be in the very beginning. And those people who have been redeemed worship God. In this, by the Spirit of God. Because that's the only way we can worship God. I can't worship God on my own. Because going back to the first, the three people that we're to be on guard about, all of those worship their God very sincerely. We have friends that are part of other religions, and listen, they are honestly worshiping their God. With the same love and devotion that we have for our God, they're worshiping their God in the same way. They're not, you know, not everybody's just these evil people wanting to do this bad stuff. They honestly are just like us. They're everyday people trying to get through life. They just have a wrong system. And the way to get the right system is through us through the right system, going and telling them about that system so the Spirit of God can come and move on their heart so they can join the right system. But we worship it by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God opens my eyes. He saves me. He does the work of redemption. I love what the Bible says. You know, it was the Father's plan of redemption that is accomplished through the work of Christ, the second person of the Trinity, and is sealed by the third person of the Trinity, the Spirit. It's a Trinitarian work of salvation. And it is because of that that we can now worship God. On our own, I can't worship God. Because again, I'm dead. I'm suppressing the truth in my flesh. I'm doing the video of my master's through the sin, I, I, I'm in no way able to unless God does something. And then I can worship Him. So that's who we are. We're of the right circumcision. We worship by the Spirit of God. We glory in Christ Jesus. What does it mean to glory in something? It's to boast in something, right? And we boast in what? As children of God. Right. Okay. After what happens? When we tend to boast our own self, and then God reminds us, and then we have, oh, sorry, God, and then we boast. Right? We boast in Christ because we are humble and we know that we don't deserve it one. God didn't look down and say, man, that guy Jeff's a pretty cool guy. God looked down and said, man, that guy Jeff's a pretty wretched guy. But that's okay because I have a plan to redeem him. And I boast and I glory in Christ. Now, this is live for Christ's glory and not my own. And I boast in Christ. And that, that's the idea. I'm living for the glory of Christ. And in some way, shape, or form, the best I can in my, my ability, I'm trying to live a life that points others to Christ so they too can boast in Him and come to know Him and realize it is all because of Him that I have life. 
And I have all that I have because of Him. And so I boast in Him. This is how I live my life. And there is a difference for the Christian living their life and others. And how we have this boasting in Christ alone. And then finally it says, we, again, of the circumcision, worship by the Spirit of God, we glory in Christ, we put no confidence in the flesh. And again, this is a, a yielding to the right given by the flesh. Um, you know, maybe your, your, uh, your birthright kind of heritage, you know, well, I'm of this line, or I'm of this, you know, I, that's the flesh. There's no confidence in that. In human effort, in placing one trust in earthly things or physical advantages. That's, that's what it means to boast in the flesh. And that's, I mean, that's pretty straightforward. If I boast in my flesh, it's because of something that I've accomplished, something that I've done. And we're going to see that in verse number four. Um, I unpacked it a little bit more because Paul unpacks it. As a true child of God, I know fundamentally the flesh has nothing to offer me but death. And so I have to look to something else for my value, for my life, for my hope. And as a Christian, we know that that is Christ. And so I look to Christ and I give Him all of the credit in my life. I can't take the credit for anything because it's everything that He's done for me, which is the reason why there's absolutely no confidence in my abilities. It's only in what He has bestowed upon us through our faith. And we boast in it. I love Paul. Yeah? He says many times, you know, I come to you, I didn't come in fancy words. I don't boast in anything but the gospel. And I love Romans 1, 16 and 17, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation. It's the power of God unto salvation. So that's, that's the, the rooted in the who we are. That is who you are. As a child of God, that is who you are now. You're no longer what you were before. You've been created into a new creature with a new nature. You're still dealing with your dead nature, but it's taken care of. We're looking forward to What's to come when all of that nonsense and all of that sin is done away with? So, our confidence and joy is rooted in what we believe, in who we are, but also it's rooted in where we look. And this is where verse number 4 comes out. So, kind of expanding on the boasting in the flesh, this is what Paul says. So, we put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh. Now, no, that Paul's kind of being so a little sarcastic here. Um, but he's going to lay out the reasons why he, according to that secular world of the time, because what that world boasted in were some of these things, he's about to out the water, because if there's anybody that accomplished anything in the flesh, we know very well Paul did. Paul, Paul, was, a, Paul was a pretty good, I mean, Paul, Paul put 150,000% into everything he did. Um, but this is what he says. says, though I myself have reason for, the, for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks that he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. So right away he says, someone else think you have confidence? Okay, guess what? I am better than you. My boasting is higher than you. This, this is the, the, the meaning behind the language that he's using. Uh, I've done more. My claim is better. I have a higher degree. Um, this, is, this is what he's communicating. Does anyone else have anything to boast in the flesh? Guess what? I have more. And then he goes on. He says this. What? I was circumcised on the eighth day. Why is that important? Well, if you know the law, the Bible, God was very specific. If you were not circumcised on the eighth day, you've broken my commandment. So, so right away, not only is the baby starting his life off wrong, the parents just have missed it as well. They've broken God's commandment. On the eighth day, circumcise the boys. So Paul, Paul can boast of his flesh. Guess what? I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel. So right away, he's part of God's chosen people. Of the tribe of Benjamin. So what is he trying to lay out here? He's trying to lay out the fact that he has he is Israelite blood, his kingship, and basic gene genealogical purity. If you're going to be a part of any group of people, should be the Jewish people, right? Well, guess what? He, he was there. He got all the T's and the I's crossed, right? He's a Hebrew of Hebrews. What is this? Um, this is, again, just going back to the, all aspects of the, the people of God, the, the life of Israel, a true Israelite in everything. His family raised him the right way. He was raised in, in a Jewish um, system. 
uh, education system, all this stuff. Everything about his life was exactly what God said for him and his parents to do for him. And you know, it was his life that he followed, all this kind of stuff. Now, these two first things are the inherited honors. So, so in this culture, they would kind of boast about their honors. Well, I've done this, I, I do this, or I, I'm part of this clan, or this tribe, or this. And so when people would greet back in the day, they would say, oh, I'm such and such. Well, I'm Jeff from Florida. You know, because I'm claiming the honor of being from Florida. Um, th this is kind of what it is. So this is the inherited honor bragging that he's laying out here, the foundation of my, my flesh. What do I have to boast in? I'm of the people of God. Oh, you're the people of God? Guess what? Everything about my life followed God's law to the T. Can you say that? Oh, no, you didn't go to Jewish school? Oh, too bad. I'm better than you. This is the foundation. And then, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. Everything about my life is what God said to do. Then he shifts and he goes to his personal achievement honors that he can boast in. What did he do? As to the law, a Pharisee. What does that mean? Exactly. He was a Pharisee and separated one. So as to the law of God, I was separated from sin and impurity, by the way. Not that he was saying he was perfect, but when it came to the law, when the law said to do this and do this and do this and do this, guess what he did? He did all of those things to the team. He didn't miss any of them. So again, this is what Paul's boasting in, in his flesh. Then what? As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. And, and a persecutor here is to, to kind of purchase or to pursue or to chase. And the idea is like an army who's chasing down their army, or an army who's chasing down their enemy who's fleeing from them. So it wasn't enough just to have the enemy flee. They're like, uh oh, we're going after him, let's go. This was the zeal with which Paul had. And we know that. He was going after the church on the road to Damascus, right? In his persecution. He got papers that said you could arrest Christians. And he was on his way to do this because he had great zeal. Now again, look at that at that point in time in his life. Was he passionate? Did he love and honor God with his life? And from his standpoint, from his religious point of view, yes. He was doing the ultimate that he could possibly do for the glory of God. And yet, it wasn't for the glory of the God. But he, you could not say that he was not passionate or didn't have enough zeal to, to do. And here he is boasting into this. So if, you're, if you get your gaze off of where it should be as a child of God, it always finds its way back to your flesh. And you'll find your... Now, Paul wasn't actually boasting in the flesh. He's giving an example because he's going to finish up this last point. But he's basically stating... Those that want to boast of the flesh, guess what? I have way more to be able to boast about. But he's going to tell us in verse number 7 what that accomplishes. But he wants us to understand that what we're supposed to be looking to is what? What Christ has done for us. A people that could not do it on our own and in any way, shape, or form. We are hopeless outside of Christ. And that's what Paul wants us to understand. Our unity. The confidence of our unity is that we are constantly gazing up at Christ. If you remember this past summer, after I got back from camp, I preached out of Colossians. It was Colossians chapter 3, 1 through 4. And it was set your mind on things above. Set your heart. Mind, heart. Set, set, seek the things that are above. Set your mind on the things of above. We kind of talk about the same thing. As a child of God, my gaze should always be at Christ. Because my confidence in this life and my confidence in joy is rooted in who I look to. And if I begin to look at my flesh, guess what happens? My flesh is going to let me down. Whether that be my finances that I'm looking to, whether it be my health that I'm looking to, my friends, my job, whatever it is in this flesh world, if I'm looking to that for my confidence, it will let me down. Because I'm meant to look to one, and that is Christ. And then that leads us to our final point, which is our confidence of joy is rooted in whom we look to. And verse number seven is pretty simple. So he goes through and he says, I can boast more than anybody else, but whatever I but whatever gain I had, 
I count it as a loss for the sake of Christ. Paul comes to the table and says, look, I got all the stuff that I've accomplished. When I look to Christ, I see how empty all of this was. And I look to Christ because I see what my Savior has done for me. And even with all of this stuff, it didn't change anything. But what Christ did changed everything. But whatever gain, everything, whatever profit that I have, and this again was going back to his Jewish honors, his fleshly work, the idea that, but I've come to regard everything that I gained in my life and in my flesh, I count it as lost. I think about it, I considered it, and I regard it. Again, he's thinking through. It's, it's, not, it's, it's this process of he, he's looking at what the gospel implications say, and he's looking at this life, this religious life that he's lived. He's thinking through, and he's taking this gospel, and he's putting it on like glasses, and he's looking at his life, and he's going, none of that meant anything. And I've considered it as loss, as harmful. Rubbish is really the idea that he's given out. It's all rubbish. All of that. All of that passion that I had, all of the religiousness, all of the customs, all the rituals, all the traditions that I've done, all of it is rubbish. It's a disadvantage. Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. In view, ahead to the gospel of gaining Christ. Church, one day we're going to get Christ. We have Christ, but one day we're going to have Him in front of us. We're going to be in His presence. We're going to be worshiping Him. We get Him. And because of that, whatever this life has to bring for us, you know, the old saying is, let it come because it doesn't matter because I'm getting Him. And that's what Paul wants to understand. Our confidence to stand and to proclaim the gospel, to live this Christian life, to walk through the hardships that we walk through, and to have a hope and a joy is rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that alone. It's not rooted in me, it's not rooted in my life, my bloodline, nothing else but Jesus Christ and Him alone. And that gives a confidence to my joy that just strengthens my joy to the point where what happens when my joy gets hammered? What happens when someone stands and says, you know what, guys? Jesus is all good and all about this stuff, but you know what? You need to come to church ten times a week. Now, as a pastor, I might say amen. But you know what? Happened? I don't have to do that. Because who I am was settled on the cross through my faith and has nothing to do with my actions, has nothing to do with rituals, Hey, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do it this way, you need to do that. No, that stuff doesn't matter. What matters is if I have repented and I have trusted in Jesus Christ to redeem me from my sin, to adopt me into a family that I was cut off from, and who has forgiven me of the very things that cut me off. That's all that matters. It is through faith alone, through Christ alone, and nothing else. Now, when we talk about the sanctification process, as we said, yeah, there's some things that we need to do to, to, to work out our sanctification. But when it comes to our confidence, when it comes to our joy, that is all settled in Christ. And that's what Paul wants us to know. Listen, this church has not yet had the full-on fight. It was coming. But what Paul wanted them to understand, hey guys, I love you so much. And I go to all these churches and I see what's going on. I see the battle. I see what these false wolves and these dogs and these mutilators have done to churches. And I want you to know how you can combat that is joy. What did he say? Rejoice in the Lord. It's a very simple phrase. But it goes throughout the whole book. If we want to be able to stand against the attacks that we face in our day and time, guess what it is? Rejoice Lord. He is our everything. Our unity, our strength, our confidence. I am confident in the gospel today, tonight, to proclaim it. Not because of something about me. Not because I went to seminary. Not because I... 
because of Christ and what He's done in my life and in my heart. It's in Him. Father, we thank You tonight. We thank You for Your Word, Lord. We thank You for Your Gospel. We thank You that You have revealed so much to us from the pages of these Scriptures, Lord, that give us the ability to stand firm in our joy that we get from You. Regardless of what life has in store for us, regardless of what happens to us, Lord, we know that in You, things are settled. And Lord, that just it gives us the ability, the power, the strength to go and live this life. Even though at times it's hard, even though it would be easier to throw our hands up and just live the way the world does, Lord, we know that what we cling to is You. And my prayer is that everybody that's here tonight knows that, understands that, Lord, maybe just needed to be reminded of that. But Lord, we pray that you would work through us, work through our church, so we can be people that, that give off the joy of what you've done for us. All for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I am God.